So far on the podcast, we haven't encountered a single Chinese character with an English name. But more importantly, we haven't looked at any female authors. It's all just been men so far. But have no fear, both of these things are about to change. I'm Angus Stewart, and you're listening to the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. So before we crack on, I'd just like to do my plugs just now, get them out of the way. So if you'd like to get the latest on the show, you should go to the Instagram. It's at, at T-R-C-H-F-I-C, Trichific, of course, for translated Chinese fiction. You can also give me a follow on Twitter. Uh, I'm Angus Likes Words on Twitter. It's not all about the podcast on there, but to be honest, that's just about the only thing I seem to find the energy to tweet about these days, because I kind of hate Twitter. But I've found a few cool people on there, including the guest of our next episode. You can find out who he is if you go to the Instagram or the Twitter. If you'd like to help support the show, I've now got two ways you can do that. You can give a monthly recurring donation on Patreon, or you can give a one-off on Buy Me A Coffee. I'll, I'll give links to both of those in the show notes. And the reason I'm asking... Well, asking? The reason I'm pointing you in these directions is because I'm paying a yearly uh, hosting fee to SoundCloud. And if people who love the show can help me pay that fee, oh, I'll be a happy, happy bunny. So those are the plugs, everybody. Let's get on with the show. So flashback to episode one of this show when I was talking about Lu Xun and his Diary of a Madman. Um, There's a few things that we should recall. First of all, Let's just refresh our memories about the May the 4th movement and the New Culture movement. So that was, um, long story short, that was a reaction among young Chinese left-wing intellectuals to kind of modernize and build up their country and like a strong anti-imperialist goal. But the kind of means for modernizing was learning a lot from the West. So there was that kind of not a contradiction, but there was, it was strongly tied into a reaction to kind of the feeling that China was backward and needed to catch up with them, the powers that were dominating it. Yes, so that was, that was the May the 4th movement. The new culture movement was its kind of cultural literary wing. Lu Xun was part of that. So we've got that flashback. The other flashback is, I believe I mentioned the Writer Street in Shanghai's Hongkou district, where Lushun's uh it's nearby Lushun Park. It's nearby the house where Lushun spent his final years. And on that street there's a mural, stone mural of various different Chinese writers, pretty much all from the Shanghai scene of the New Culture Movement. And on there is one lone lady with a a name that's just two characters, quite easy to read, uh for beginner level Chinese readers like me. It's Ding Ling, and the book we're doing today, or the short story, I should say, that we're doing today by her is called Sha Fei Nu Shu De Ruji. So we can translate that two ways. I suppose four ways, because we can say it's her name is either Sophie or Sophia, and we can say the diary of or so-and-so's diary. So (laughs) we could have... um, the Diary of Miss Sophie, The Diary of Miss Sophia, or we could have Miss Sophie's Diary or Miss Sophia's Diary. I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm beating that to death. The version I read translates the title as Miss Sophia's Diary, and the version I read is a PDF. The reason I didn't invest in an actual book is because there's basically been no nice publications, no decent looking English language publications of Dingling's work for a very long time. So I just didn't really fancy investing in a kind of badly designed cover from decades ago. So um, I just popped online to see if this short story was available as a PDF. Um, Hopefully the copyright people won't come to strangle me. But anyway, I had a PDF of this short story taken from the selected writings of Ding Ling uh, entitled, I Myself Am A Woman. This is probably the main big collection you'll be getting your hands on if you're trying to read her in English, unless you're on a university program that's giving you this exact PDF. So the translations in this collection were by Tani E. Barlow and Gary J. Bjorge, I think that's pronounced, and it was published by Beacon Press of Boston in 1989. And 
if you Google Beacon Press, like I did in research for this show, you'll find they're still going and they're what you might call a radical publisher. So they're publishing kind of lefty and liberal uh, dissident voices, underrepresented voices. I did not really take a note of how American versus international their perspective is. I think that's always worth worth considering. But certainly in 1989, it was them who managed to put together this translation, translated collection of Dingling's writings. So back to the new culture movement and um, Dingling and Lu Xun being in the same wee gang operating in Shanghai. So before I talk about her personal life, yeah, let's just compare this diary of Miss Sophie with the diary of a madman because they've both used the diary format. It's, you know, it's first person. It's a personal chronological format, um, kind of in the Western style of following an individual and looking through their eyes. But Lucian's story is definitely intended as a very deliberate metaphor for the state of the Chinese nation. And the kind of the characters the character's feelings aren't really the main like his personal dilemmas aren't really the big issue for him. The 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 kind of the big push and pull of the story is is what he's seeing real, or is it imagined? How mad is he, I suppose? Whereas in Miss Sophia's diary, there's a totally personal, totally emotional, totally internal journey, which is part of what makes this such a special and feminist story, because it's taking a woman's perspective, and she's, for as, as far as we can tell, she's a totally independent, liberated young lady, although of course she has her problems based on like where she is in society. So that's the big difference, and that's why this book's a wee bit apart from the rest of the new culture movement, which was a lot more political and male-dominated than Dingling's writings are. <laughs> I haven't phrased that very well. Anyway, um, if you if if you like this podcast, then you could certainly find other podcasts about Sophie, Miss Sophie, and Dingling. Unlike the other podcasts I've done on some books, like uh, Murong Sui Shun's um, Leave Me Alone, Wang Shua's Please Don't Call Me Human, this is an episode where there are rival episodes out there. So um, the Chinese Literature Podcast, they've got two Dingling episodes. They've got one on uh, Xia Village, one on The Diary of Miss Sophie. You should check those both out. And the BBC has a very cool podcast series called Chinese Characters where they look at different individuals from throughout Chinese history and just kind of talk about them. And they have an episode of On Dingling, which starts off by talking about the Diary of Miss Sophie, and it's really good. So definitely do check that out if you want if you want more. So moving on, let's talk a wee bit about Dingling herself and her life before we talk about the story. So Dingling is a pen name, as Chinese writers often adopt, just like Murong Shui Sun did. She was born with the name Jiang Wei, and that was in the year 19, uh, 1904 in Hunan. And as an adult, she adopted a Corsi name, which is a, a Chinese tradition where you adopt these uh, names as you reach adulthood. They're called uh, Zhi, I believe, courtesy names. Her courtesy name was Jiang Bing Zhi. Um, but then, of course, later as a writer, she picked the pen name Ding Ling. Uh, under the old stupid Wade Giles system of romanization, she was known in to to Westerners as Tingling. Why? I don't know why. It's so stupid. Anyway, um, yeah, so she was from quite a wealthy family. Her dad passed away when she was three, so she was raised by her mother, who was a hero because her mum was also running a school, so was a teacher. Um, they were staying in her maternal uncle's home, so her mum's brother, and that was probably a problem for her from a very young age because... The young Jiang Wei, aka Jiang Bingzhi, aka Dingling, was betrothed to her uncle's son, her cousin from childhood. Um, it maybe gives you an idea why she might have been keen to join the May Fourth Movement, the anti kind of Confucian anti tradition movement. Uh, so anyway, by eighteen years old, she'd successfully broken off this engagement. And how she did that, I don't know. I find it kind of amusing. She criticized her uncle in a local newspaper. So definitely a sign of the changing times. Out in Hunan, this kind of Western style of publication, a newspaper was available for her to um, save herself, I suppose, by writing a criticism. Interesting, definitely interesting. Um, so that same year, after she escaped that kind of family bond, 
She enrolled at a girls' school over in Shanghai, so quite a length of the country away. That's a big leap from Hunan. And this wasn't any old school. This was a school founded by the May the 4th intellectuals, the left-wing intellectuals. So I went digging for information on this school, and I found its location. The former site is marked on Google Maps with its Chinese name in pinyin. So its Chinese name, and I'm not going to do the tones correctly here, <laughs> is the Pingming Nuxiao. And it just means People's Girls School. And with, in Shanghai, that's near what I kind of think of as the Laowai Hell Pit, found 158, or Laowai Park. Um, if you are a Shanghai lander, you'll know what I'm on about. So yeah, it's uh, pretty central, still standing. You can go check it out. So at this school, at the Pingming Nuxiao, the People's Girls School, and then at university, Dingling became involved in the left-wing literary scene. Remember, it was a bit of a sausage fest. She married a poet called Hu Yepin. Sorry about the tones there. And her and Hu um, lived in various places in, in major Chinese cities. I think Shanghai, Nanjing, and Beijing are the biggies. Um, the West, they lived in the western hills of Beijing, which is an area that pops up in the diary of Miss Sophie. I'm not going to be consistent with the translations of the story's name, by the way, so... It's going to be all over the place, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so the marriage was all, all rosy, but in 1931, uh, Hu Yepin was executed for being associated with the Communist Party. And this was, he, w he was killed in the, um, gosh, what was it called? The Long, this was an area I used to live by, Longhua. Yeah, the Longhua um, Prison, which is a site you can visit in Shanghai where lots of Chinese communists were killed by the KMT, the Kuomintang uh, government. It's a, it's a big kind of martyr site within China, certainly within Shanghai. Um, if you're in Shanghai, do go. It's got a park where um, when I visited, I saw about five old men all within stone's throw, dis stone's throw distance of each other playing saxophone. So just for that alone. And there was very cute cats there as well. So for history, little cats and old saxophonists do go. I think we're getting sidetracked. Yeah, so one year after Hu Yepin was executed by the nationalist government, the Guomindang Party, she joined the Communist Party. And this was a really big turning point in her life because the party expected you to follow the party line. So after Ding Ling's success in Republican 20s China, writing individualistic stories about the aspirations and disappointments of new Chinese women, um, just like the diary of Miss Sophie. She switched it up for something a little bit more um, nationalistic, patriotic, left-wing, socialist, all those things. But, of course, if you know anything about the Mao Zedong era, you'll know that won't help you. That will do nothing for you. If you're a writer, you are eventually going to be screwed. Lu Xun perhaps being one exception. So in 1942... Before the, the revolution was successful, mind you, Dingling was shot down by Mao. Um, this was while she was in their Yan'an base, I believe, uh, because she was complaining about the party's shortcomings in women's liberation. She felt that, for example, the right to divorce that had been granted um, to men and women was kind of being abused by the men. She felt that there was double standards about what was expected of women, they were um, told that they should be, you know, model soldiers, model communists. But if they didn't keep up their traditional feminine duties, they would be judged, etc., etc. And she complained, and Mao said, stop complaining. So that damaged her position. Fast forward 15 years to 1957, when there was a big anti-rightist, put that in quotes, anti-rightist purge. Basically where you, if you expressed any doubt about <coughs> Mao schools, um, or you did not adhere to the most left-wing position, you were shot down. That's exactly what happened to her. Her work was banned. Then fast forward to the Cultural Revolution, which kind of lines up with the Hippie Revolution in the West, so like kind of mid to late 60s through to mid 70s. During that, she was sent to jail for five years, and then after five years in jail, she got 12 years of farm labour until her rehabilitation in 1978 and then eight years after her rehabilitation she passed away 
And during those eight years, her work kind of resurfaced. She got to do a trip to the United States to the uh, some some kind of writer's position in the University of Iowa. So she, I think she, her and her her readers and fans and rehabilitators in the government and in the literary scene did good things for her in those eight years. So a kind of a happy ending to the story. So let's talk about the story itself. So my copy of The Diary of Miss Sophie was a 32-page journey with Sophia, or or Sophie. Um, And she's a young Chinese woman living in Beijing with tuberculosis. Uh, The plot's not too heavy, I wouldn't say. It's our journey, the journey we go on with her. It's mostly through her mental state and her romantic kind of dilemmas and her sexual desires. It's certainly not shy about those. Um, Although itself... the content itself is not explicit, but it's very open and honest about her sexuality. There's there's no more polite way for me to say that. Um, so her big dilemma comes when she meets a new man named Ling Jinshe, and he's somewhat exotic. He's Singaporean Chinese, uh, so he's from across the sea, from the, the warm south. And he's he's a handsome guy. The descriptions of him are luscious let's say there's a lot of description of his lips it kind of reminded me of a scottish book called sunset song that i had to read in high school and that was written by uh, a man a straight man as far as we know called lewis grassett given but from the perspective of a young scottish girl and there's a man she meets who's kind of described in the same way like um kind of like dangerous and powerful but also i just know I'm not. I'm not doing it justice for 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 reasons. Um, but yeah, he gets a, a lot of description layered on him. This guy Ling Jinshu. But on the other hand, she realizes after not too long he's a very shallow guy and he's kind of a pig as well. So her big dilemma is: What do I do about my attraction to Ling Jinshu, and how does that affect me as a liberated new woman of China? Uh, so she's also got what appears to be. A, boy, a more traditional sort of boyfriend called Wei Di. But Wei Di is just completely hopeless. Uh, he, he just cries all the time. He kind of pledges himself, but Sophie just kind of takes cruel pleasure in humiliating him, giving him absolutely not. But also kind of um, occasionally flickering towards pity, and she's never cruel enough to shake him off. She just kind of wishes that she could tell him or that he could see he should be her friend or her you know her quote unquote brother not not her boyfriend so that, that those are the men in her life or at least in this story and she kind of ends up torn i'd say between her independent and kind of rational side that can see what she's doing to herself and knows that she really ought to hate jin shu and she also like has this instinct to just cave in call her call him what does she want to call him is it master? There's a part of her that just wants him to totally be her boss and she knows that that's messed up. And yeah, like I said, the plot isn't the main thing. The main thing is the kind of thoughts and whimsies and insights and flights of fancy that uh, Miss Sophia has. I think I saw some, some writer describing her as delusional, which is not fair. Um, I think she's no more delusional than every person is, but she's just brutally honest about it. Um, So the kind of closure of the novel, turn off here if you don't want spoilers, is that she decides she's going to leave Beijing to live out her last days in the south. Uh, We're not told how far south that is, whether that's the Jiangnan region, like Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Shanghai, or whether that's going to be all the way down in the semi-tropics of Guangzhou, uh, Guangdong province, Hong Kong. In any case, she's just totally disillusioned with her life. And also with the diary format, she's realized that basically all the things that she set out to solve haven't been solvable. She's um, She thinks there's no answers and she's got a terminal illness that there appears to be no cure for. So she just thinks like, fuck it, I'm going to hit the road where no one knows me, live out my days as I've been living them, but you know, without hopefully things that freeze me in my tracks like Ling Jinshu. So there's there's a summary of what happens. Um, why is this story? Well, why why did the story leave a mark at the time it did? Because it was hugely successful. So as I talked about 
in the Lushun episode. This was a time of modernization, liberalization, westernization, and all these forces were clashing with the kind of traditional Confucian values of imperial China. And I think everywhere in the world that has modernized, these two forces have collided. The kind of conservative forces where you get matched up by your family, where um, love isn't top priority, um, what you want as an individual isn't top priority versus the new age of finding someone you love or just doing what you like, seeking pleasure before practical or traditional concerns. So it was a pertinent story at the time and it lives on as a pertinent story and especially because it's written by a woman, about a woman and perhaps for a woman. I think you don't have to be a lady to enjoy this book but you might get more out of it um, perhaps if you're a Chinese woman. Again, that's definitely not me. But yeah, it's it's a it's a really fascinating insight into a really vividly realized and interesting character. Cause Sophie slash Sophia is definitely a very kind of quirky individual. If she was ri- if it, if the book was written exactly as it was today, she might come off as like a bit of a manic pixie dream girl, perhaps. Um but at the time, imagine this is it's the twenties in a country that's just ceased being an em- a country ruled by an emperor a few decades ago. So think how mind-blowing, or not mind-blowing, think how forward-thinking it must have seemed at the time. We won't really know, because we weren't there, but it's certainly an interesting thing to consider. A wee side note here. So I had gone in thinking this would be a, a story of Shanghai, about the kind of, um, you know, the modern cigarette-smoking, cheapa-wearing, liberated Shanghai jazz-era lady. But Although the story was written in Shanghai, it's actually set in Beijing. Not that this is very important, because I'm sure a lot of the the cultural forces that were kind of modernizing Shanghai were also present in Beijing. But um, perhaps the reason that Beijing and the Western its Western Hills feature is because um, at the time, Dingling and her husband were kind of flitting between these two big cities, these two big cultural nexuses. Nexus is my new favorite word, by the way. So this is going to make me sound like a bit of a moron, but one of the most useful resources I had for researching this episode was the Wikipedia page of Miss Sophie's Diary. Um, It had a really interesting quote from Dingling about how Western authors, and not just Western, but foreign authors inspired her. Um, I'm just going to read that for you now, because I think it's really good. Okay, I stand corrected. It's actually on Dingling's Wikipedia page, not the page of the story. But it's really interesting. So this is an introduction to a publication of Miss Sophie's Diary and Other Stories. I'm not sure if that's the English translated version or the Chinese version, but anyway, here's what Dingling, as an old as an old lady, says in her introduction. Quote starts here. I can say that if I had not been influenced by Western literature, I prob I would probably not have been able to write fiction, or at any rate, not the kind of fiction in this collection. It is obvious that my earliest stories followed the path of Western realism. A little later, as the Chinese Revolution developed, my fiction changed with the needs of the age and of the Chinese people. Literature ought to join minds together, turning ignorance into mutual understanding. Time, place and institutions cannot separate it from the friends it wins. And in 1957, a time of spiritual suffering for me, I found consolation in reading much Latin American and African literature. So just to decode that, yeah, her early writing, um, which in this case we'll just take to mean Miss Sophie's Diary, does have quite a few Western influences. Um, There's a few that get name-checked a lot. One's um, Madame Bovary. I'm not sure how valid that is, I've never read it. But yeah, this kind of realistic um, depiction of an individual uh, like a fully rounded 3D individual with very few political concerns. The one thing I've read that would match up with that in timeline and style might be The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. But certainly things of that mould were what Dingling started writing. Then her hobby got executed. She joined the Communist Party. Her writing did become political and proletarian. And then 1957, the time of suffering, that was the anti-rightist purge, and I just think it's really interesting that she was not looking to Western literature anymore, but still not just reading 
politically friendly or domestic literature. She was looking to the de- developing world, which I suppose would be kind of in touch with Maoism in a way. But yeah, really nice wee quote there on... I'm going to read one wee excerpt from the diary of Miss Sophie for you. Um, not going to read more than one, just because I think uh, it'll be a bit cringy, me trying to speak in her voice. It's far too different as people, um, even though she's not a real person. But yeah, uh, here's what I'm going to So quote starts here. I've always wanted a man who would really understand me. If he doesn't understand me and my needs, then what good are love and empathy? Father, my sisters, and all my friends end up blindly indulging me, although I've never figured out what it is in me that they love. Is it my arrogance? My temper? Or do they just pity me because I have TV? TB? At times, they infuriate me because of it, and then all their blind love and soothing words have the opposite effect. Those are the times that I wish I had someone who really understood. Even if he reviled me, I'd be proud and happy. So there's a lot of things in that little paragraph that are characteristic of the whole story. So the kind of wild fluctuation between positive and negative thoughts and emotions, the kind of unsympathetic portrayal of Sophie. She's openly talking about all her kind of un- unfriendly, nasty, darker thoughts, but also talking very intimately about just things she needs from life and wants from her friends, family, and the opposite sex. So yeah, I think that would qualify as feminist, you know, to my understanding. In these episodes where we talk about uh, an author and their work, I also try to find some other person's analysis. So I'm going to read you a fairly hefty chunk of In Quest of the Writer Dingling by Yi Tse Mei Feuerwerker. So interesting Chinese and German name there. This is from Feminist Studies, Volume 10, Number 1, 1984. So this is written, I think, before Dingling's rehabilitation. So really early on the ball for Western discussion of her writing. So here it goes. Although Dingling's early stories won recognition for the unprecedented audacity and sensitivity with which she depicted the psychology of modern young women, more recent criticism has focused on the social context of the dilemmas of her characters. Although liberated in the sense that they have broken with traditional authority, they lack the economic means and social support needed for any genuine independence. They might be free of the institutionalized oppression of fathers and husbands, but they become all the more vulnerable to the pain of betrayal by lovers or by their own fluctuating emotions. Sophie uses the diary form for a relentless investigation of the self caught in this predicament. Her apparent liberation from the constraints of social structures leads her to feel that she has no one to blame but herself for what she was doing or suffering. She is therefore all the more anxious to analyse and understand her own behaviour. Yet as spectator and self-conscious actor in her own drama, she often catches herself playing a part, indeed making it difficult for others to give her the true understanding that she craves, while sabotaging at the same time her own efforts to evolve an intelligible and authentic image of the self to cope with their personal crisis. By the end of the diary, Sophie has become disillusioned with both herself and the diary as a means towards self-understanding. Thus the story in theme and form is a provocative inquiry into the limits of subjectivism in modern literature, which, oh, and for Chado's Dingling's readiness to move into a broader arena, arena for her fictional explorations so very well put there by miss what's her name again by miss um yitza may feuerwerker i think that was a pretty spot on analysis and yeah from what i could gather um other protagonists that dingling was writing about at the time were all kind of in the same mold as sophie she was writing i think she was writing for her readers her readers were seeing themselves in the character she was writing for the young new women of shanghai and of china and yeah, honestly, good for her because it's an interesting little window in history because um, in this kind of freer period in the 20s and 30s, that turned into the Japanese invasion, the Civil War, World War II, Civil War Part Two, the revolution, and then the communist era. So this wee window that Dingling was writing in of kind of individualistic, individualistic feminism and not Mao Zedong branded, um, you know, you must do feminism this way feminism. It's an interesting wee window, um, and I'll stop blabbering. Okay, my last wee piece of analysis here is an interesting thing I noticed that I've not seen other people mention, is that in the story, Sophia, or Sophie, refers to herself in third person quite a few times. Um, There's a line near the end where she says in a bittersweet manner, oh, Sophia has a lover. But earlier on, there's more kind of playful uses where she says, oh, you know, Sophia thinks this. People don't know that Sophia likes this, blah, blah, blah. 
And based on some things I saw when I was living in China, where some Chinese people did the same thing with their English name, I wonder if having this kind of adopted alternative name, a foreign name, gives the character Sophia the distance to reflect upon herself as she does through most of the diary. And perhaps that inadvertently furthers her own isolation from herself and the characters around her, because she's the only character in the story who has an English name. And although in, the story is published in Chinese and her name will be written Sha Fei, it's clearly a Chinese rendering of Sophie or Sophia. It's not, it's not a Chinese name. It's an adopted name on top of whatever Chinese name her parents would have given her. So. Perhaps I'm reading too much into that, but I think it's a big... Especially since the Singaporean character, so the guy who's coming over from a British colony, has not himself got a British name. He's got a Mandarin Chinese name. So yes, that's my little last nugget of thought for you. What I haven't prepared for this episode is to talk about the two translators of this collection of Dingling's writing. I might look into them and see if they pop up in any future stories we do, but... If you know anything about these two guys, um, their names being Tan E. E. Barlow and Gary J. Bjorge, and I'm assuming Tan is a man. I don't know if that's a male or female name. So if you want to educate your show host about these two translators, please do get in touch through Twitter, through Instagram, uh, any means you can to zap me a message, please do. And of course, if I've badly mispronounced anything, if I've made any totally bungus uh, factual claims, then please do also zap me a message. If you've got anything that you'd like to say about Dingling, you can send me a message that, and I, I can read it out on the show. If you can send me a voice message, I can play that on the show. You know, join in, participate. I'd love to talk with you. Really, I'm not just saying that to be weird. It's exciting when someone who enjoys the show reaches out. Don't be shy. I'm not an expert. I'm learning as I go. So anything you say is just as valid as anything I have to say. Oh, I'd also like to say if anyone from a publishing house is listening, what a huge niche in the market you have right here. Because like I said, there's been no nice versions of Dingling's writings. So perhaps the struggle might be getting a hold of the rights. I don't know how one would do that. But what I think readers in the English world certainly need, whether or not they want it, is a nice, new, clean, tidy, cheap, maybe Penguin classic. Hint, hint, Penguin, if you're listening. That's my two cents. We need some new editions of her work in English. It will still sell, guaranteed, especially Diary of Miss Sophie. That's about all we've got time for on this show. I'd just like to advertise our next episode. We're going to have a translator on to talk about Sophie's diary and also the things he's been involved in too. And I'm not going to tell you his name. You need to go to Instagram or Twitter to find that. So remember, Instagram is trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C, and my Twitter is Angus Likes Words. Remember, you can support the show on Patreon or you can buy me a coffee on Buy Me A Coffee. Um, all those links will be in the show notes. All support is appreciated. And thank you so much for listening. Please keep listening. Tell your friends. Tell your teachers. Tell everybody. Tell your dog. If it's, you know, if it speaks English or Chinese. On that note, 再见. <laughs>